Are you, are you coming to the tree with a strong upper man? The same murder three. Strange things that have been here, no stranger would it be if we met at midnight in the hanging tree. Coffee. Without it, we would never have had the Industrial Revolution. We'd all be still living in Europe in mud huts. Here in Laredo, we have the Organic Man Coffee Trike. 4501 McPherson, the best coffee on the planet. If you can't get to Laredo, you can order from the Organic Man Coffee Trike dot shop. Welcome to Storytime with Chris James. I may have mentioned this already, but I'll go ahead and go over it for you new listeners. When I first started writing the bag novel, The Bag Company, I didn't intend for Pam Bogus to be the main character. The main character was going to be an 18-year-old guy. Well, the character just didn't fit. No matter what I did, I couldn't force the character to be the way I wanted him to be. So I changed it to an 18-year-old girl. And that seemed to work a little better, but the age was wrong, so I made her 17, and suddenly the story seemed to work. So that's why the bag company is about a 17-year-old girl instead of an 18-year-old guy. So here we go with book number four, The Bag Back to School. <clears throat> Chapter 1. Missing. Are you sure it's safe? I mean, look at this place. Mindy was sitting in the passenger seat of the Mustang, trying to not get creeped out. Ralph was more interested in Mindy than the building they had stopped in front of. I'm sure it's safe. What, you think this is some kind of a horror movie? He glanced out the windshield. Yikes, it kind of looks creepy. The two had been driving around looking for some place out of the way to park and do things. This being the last night of summer vacation, neither of them was particularly interested in returning to school in the morning. They had spent the evening driving around town, gradually working their way out to the country. They had followed an old country road that had taken them to an unused-looking side road. That had wound around until it ended at what just might have once been a driveway. If not for the cracked and crumbling pavement, it could have been just a goat path leading back into the trees. The wrought iron gate was barely visible, laying in the brush to either side of the opening. <clears throat> Ralph had debated trying the narrow opening, not wanting to scratch his car. It wasn't as if the car wasn't already scratched. Now, there was more body filler and primer than actual paint. But still, it was his pride and joy. He'd paid all of his savings for it. A five hundred dollars. Look, the front door is open. Let's go see how it looks on the inside. Ralph was hoping to find a well-furnished and uninhabited house with maybe a well-stocked refrigerator full of beer. And never mind, the house looked as if it hadn't been occupied in years, and there was just no way any beer was going to be cold. Mindy had spent many a year working on her looks when she should have focused on her brain just a bit. Okay, maybe we'll find a quiet place to get to know each other better. And she gave Ralph a purrant look. But I already know you, and you already know me. Ralph wasn't that bright. He looked from her to the house. Let's go see if there's anything in the fridge. He opened his door and jumped out. Mindy waited for Ralph to open her door. When Ralph tromped up onto the great big porch, uh, she decided she'd have to do her own door opening. So much for chivalry. As she got out and straightened her skirt. Well, you could at least wait for me, she yelled at the empty entryway. 
Mindy walked across the dirt expanse, her high heels sinking into the soft dirt. The stairs had seen better days, as well as better centuries. She took a tentative step up onto the first tread. When nothing happened, she tried the next. Still not dead or dying, so she gained a bit of courage and a clomped up onto the wood of the portico. Hey, where'd you go? She looked at the door, thinking how much it resembled the front door of the house in The Haunting. The movie The Haunting, 1999, which was a remake of the movie The Legend of Hell House from 1973, which was a remake of the movie The Haunting of Hill House, 1963. Now pick one, they all had creepy looking houses with really creepy looking front doors that the cast entered, but some of them never left. The door hung there inviting her to just take a peek inside. Uh, just maybe there might be a shoe store or an ice cream parlor or uh, some other unexplained and unnatural something in there. Maybe the last inhabitants had left behind all their priceless jewelry. Why do people go into places they shouldn't? Curiosity? Now that's what leads to new and wonderful discoveries, as well as killing off a lot of folks who don't know what they're doing. A Madame Curie discovered radium, and then it killed her. Leaning on the door, she pushed it inwards, using the wood as a shield as well as a way in. Nope, nothing hiding there in the dark. Hey, Ralph, where'd you go? She maneuvered her body in and looked about the massive vestibule. This had been a foyer used to notify visitors that the owners of the house attached had more money than anybody else living in this country, combined. The sound of footsteps came from the doorway in front of Mindy. Crunch, crunch, creak, pop, crunch. It wasn't that she was fearless, it was that she wasn't smart enough to know when fear was a good thing. Like a survival instinct, as she went to see who was clomping about in the hallway. The house was dark, and neither Mindy nor her semi-boyfriend, latest Amour, had ever been in a situation where a flashlight might be needed. As seeing a dark shadow moving in the dark hallway, Mindy just assumed, and you know what that means, that it was Ralph. For once in her life, she had guessed correctly. Ralph, I asked you to wait for me, and she gave him her best pissed-off look, which was wasted since it was too dark to see her face. Hey, come check it out. This place is way cool. Ralph missed the not-at-all subtile sound of Miss Mindy's, Mindy's voice. He led the way back to what should be the kitchen. The door was closed, and it befuddled Ralph's best efforts to open it. A darn thing must be locked or something. He tried pushing and then pulling. Then he kicked it with his foot. This did more damage to his foot than to the door. He turned to stare at Mindy in the dark, his foot hurting from contacting a solid oak mass. He leaned back against the unhurt door and his shoulder accidentally pushed against it. It slid sideways a few inches. Oh, uh, er, it opens weird. He grabbed the edge of the door and pushed. The door was not the kind of door that swings on hinges. Oh no, it was one of those ingenious devices devised that rolled on a track and slid into the wall, better known as a pocket door. A common enough access point, but a completely new concept to a certain pair of novice house crashers. Wow, that was so space-agey, uh, kind of like something from a sci-fi movie. Mindy grabbed the door and slid it back and forth. She would have tried to wear out the door if not for it being used many years before her mother and father were among the living. There's a fridge. I hope there's some brew. At one time it had been white with a huge coil set atop the er, top. Ralph grasped the door handle and pulled. This time the door opened like a real door. It swung open to reveal an empty storage space. Moonlight was just barely helping out. Shoot, nothing here to drink. He slammed the door shut. 
Mindy wandered about the kitchen, trying to see where there was no light. Do you think there might be spiders or something? She brushed her hands down her front, hoping the spider webs didn't come with multi-legged creatures. Maybe we should dry upstairs. We might find something up there worth taking. Ralph hoped they could find a safe filled with cash. But then how would they get a, the safe open if there was one? He started hoping they would find a sack filled with cash instead. Maybe an old mattress stuffed full of bills, accidentally left behind by the former residents. Wasn't that what rich people did? It was dark and getting darker as the pair made their way up the huge old staircase. The treads creaked and dust wafted up, making them both sneeze. If they could have seen, and if they were the kind to admire such things, they might have been impressed by the magnificent banister with hand-carved spindles and a curved treads. The old threadbare carpet that kind of tried to cover each step, but they weren't and they couldn't, so they didn't. This stairway is too long. Why would anybody want such a high ceiling? Mindy groused as she led the way. Ralph had let her go first, and not because he was a gentleman, but so if there were any monsters lurking about, uh, they'd eat Mindy first, thus allowing him to make a break for the safety of his car. Maybe they were giants. Ralph thought this might just have been the truth. You think? Wow, I never thought of that. Mindy never thought of a lot of things. Her high heels made clicking sounds as she ascended the stairs. As the last step came up under their feet, the two came to a landing. The hallway led away in both directions. Doors opened off the corridor that could give access to just about anything. Man, this place must have hundreds of bedrooms, Mindy kind of exaggerated just a bit. Now what? Well, let's have a look, Ralph opened the first door on his right. It looked as if the people living here had simply left in the morning with intentions of returning that night. There was a bedroom, fully furnished and ready for inhabitation to come walk in. Well, whoever it was would need to do a lot of cleaning, a whole lot of cleaning. There was a bed, a chest of drawers, and a dresser, all covered with cobwebs and dust. Even the cobwebs were dusty. A cobweb is an abandoned spider web, uh, kind of like a house these two were currently prowling about, only for spiders. Look at the bed, Mindy stared at this old-fashioned four-poster with full canopy over the top. What you, going, what you got in mind, Ralph thought the bed was nasty, but then, what the heck, it was a bed. No, look, there's somebody in it, I think. Mindy had switched from talking to whispering, as if now she had concerns about waking the unmoving form just discernible in the dark. Ralph looked close, and sure enough, there was what looked like an image under the covers. The moonlight coming through the dust-filled curtains was just adequate to show a man-sized, or it could have been a woman-sized, lump under the covers. Um... Maybe we should get out of here. I didn't know anybody was living in this place. Mindy backed to the door, ready to flee. Ralph, not thinking once more as usual, reached over and lifted the bed cover. Oh my God! Mindy turned and ran. She didn't think of herself as being a coward, as she thought of herself as wanting out of here no matter what. As she didn't see what Ralph had found in the bed, but his scream was all it took to motivate her flight from the room. Earlier, Mindy had picked out some high heels that showed off her legs. Now she wished she'd picked some running shoes to show off her competitive skills. Although physically lacking, she felt as if a marathon or two could possibly be in her near future. She had also picked out a mini skirt to, once more, show off her legs. This, surprisingly, was a plus in the situation. She bounded out the door and across the hallway. The shoes did nothing to grab hardwood floor or, or the wool carpet running down the center. She slammed into the opposite wall. 
Her shoulder bounced off the plaster, leaving a bit of a dent in the wall as her body turned and made haste for the stairs. Uh, through the sound of heels clicking on the floor and dress swishing through the air came the sound of combat. Ralph was fighting someone or something for his life. As she reached the first step going down, his cries were cut short. Mindy nearly twisted her ankle as one shoe was pulled from her foot. She would have continued her flight, but hey, this was an expensive pair of shoes. And so uh, she stopped and felt about with her hands in the gloom of the stairway. Her hand came down on something that felt like a bone. It still had meat on it. Ugh, gross, nasty. It clung to her fingers as she tried to remove the nasty thing by shaking her hand. Once the rotten appendage was clear of her hand, uh, she felt around once more. Her fingers closed on the heel of her missing footwear. The smear of somebody's dinner felt awful against the smooth texture of her shoe. Clutching her most valued possession to her chest, she began running for her life, which seemed to take second place to her wardrobe. Mindy clicked and clomped down the stairs. There was a sound of wind coming from behind her. Mindy hit the bottom of the stairs and turned for the front door. In the dark, she could just make out the entrance by the thin windows running along each side. Her hand reached for the knob, a feeling along the wood until her fingers wrapped around the cold metal. She turned the doorknob. It refused her wishes. No! Oh, come on! This thing wasn't even closed when we got here. Her mind tried to remember if she or Ralph had been stupid enough to close and lock this only means of escape. I know I didn't close this door. Mindy was about to get into a long, arduous mental process when the sound of death coming down the stairs invaded her concentration. She turned and fled down the corridor, heading to the kitchen. As she was about to pass through the portal, the pocket door slammed shut right in her path. Her body bounced off the incredibly sturdy wood and hot breath of her pursuer engulfed her world. Chapter 2. Back to School The alarm went off and Pam sat up and nearly collided with Sarah, who had refused to move back in with her sister and mother, as so she'd spent the night in the kitchen with Pam. "'What you gonna do about your hair?' as Sarah followed Pam into the bathroom and watched as she brushed her teeth and tried to run a comb through what was left of her hair. "'I'll just comb it over like uh, Pam looked at her reflection.' That looks like I'm a middle-aged man. A Pam sprayed hairspray all over the flap. It looked weird. A baseball cap that belonged to her dad would help. She tried to draw her eyebrow back on, but it came out a bit wide. If you don't know what's going on, you have to go back and read The Bag Go Squatching to find out why Pam was missing her eyebrow and half her hair. A Pam offered to drive Sandy to school, since they had some of the same classes, but Sandy said she'd rather die than be seen in that tacky-looking truck. As Sandy had received a Jaguar, compliments of her dad, but it was no longer running, since she may have forgotten to fill the tank. Pam grabbed a cup of coffee and her lunch and headed for the door. It just hope the voices in my head aren't too much of a distraction. So, where are we going today? I hope we don't have a test first thing. You ever seen that movie, Christine? Look, I'm going to school. If you guys want to come, fine, but please shut up so I can concentrate. My grades are just a bit low right now, and I need to bring them up if I ever hope to get into college. Pam tried to shift into gear with her coffee cup still in her right hand. This didn't work, so she switched hands and tried to hold the steering wheel and the coffee cup. Man, I wish this was an automatic. Her last car had been an automatic. It had also been a rolling wreck. A 1980 Chevy Malibu with mismatched doors and orange shag carpet everywhere, which now was being stripped of parts at her aunt's house. 
It was a long story. Yes, see, the bag goes squatching if you want the details. Otherwise, just go with the idea her car was swapped out for this pickup. And those voices in her head, that too would be cleared up by a quick read of the previous three novels. The coffee cup wound up sitting on the dashboard as Pam worked the shift arm and turned the steering wheel, getting her pickup as well as herself, rolling in the direction of her school. The paint was faded, and there was plenty of scratches from driving up and down roads too narrow to pass without brushing things on both sides of the road. The crack in the windshield was mostly on the passenger side. Her book bag was occupying a place of honor in the trash can. Her laundry was beyond any effort of washing, so Paula, a.k.a. Mom, had opted for purchasing a new book bag and replacing what had been in it as opposed to any attempt at cleaning and, ruin and running the risk of serious damage to herself and her washing machine, which was yet to be delivered since she hadn't gotten around to purchasing it yet. The old washer had been sacrificed along with the lawnmower as a means of building an emergency snowblower used to rescue a bunch of neighbors trapped in the mid-July blizzard. Uh, see the bag here we go again if you have any questions. Pam was using a pillowcase to carry her school supplies. Her gym clothes, a handful of pencils, and an abacus. Having worked at the bag company for over the summer, uh, Pam was now going old school when it came to anything aside from her cell phone. Her lunch sack was stuffed into the pillowcase as well. A small thermos of coffee would have to see her through the day. Uh, see the bag company for all the sordid details. Pam worked the shift arm and got into third gear just in time to have to stop at an intersection. When it was her turn, she dropped into first, gave it some gas, grabbed her coffee cup as it slid towards her lap, pushed in on the clutch and the gear shift into second, coffee cup back onto the dashboard, grabbed the steering wheel, grabbed the coffee cup, straightened the pickup into third gear, coffee cup to lips, all this without having to think about it. Which was a good thing, because right now Pam was wondering about her job. Pam was worried that her latest hire, which was actually her uncle's latest hire, even though Pam had done the deed, as she was still wondering if just maybe Hildy and Hilda were not one and the same person, but with two opposite and distinctively different personalities. Well, at least Hortense was a good pick. Pam was quite pleased with herself for bringing Hortense into the company. Hortense was a scryer and a card reader as well as being six foot eight tall and a very pleasant to hang out with as long as she didn't consider you to be a poser or a charlatan. Hortense made up for her lack of tact by being a very gifted psychic. Pam made a note to check in with Cassandra during her lunch break. Then Pam made a second note to be careful when calling the office since Hildy or Hilda would be the one or ones answering the phone. An idea, all but a bad one, jumped uninvited into Pam's head. I could just drive over and have a quick look to see what's going on. Pam considered how to accomplish this feat of mismanagement. It would take maybe 20 minutes to drive over. Let's see, 20 plus about 30 to maybe 20 minutes to see if all is well. And then maybe 20 minute drive back to school. And Pam did the math. Well, 60 minutes squeezed into a 50 minute time frame. This wasn't adding up right. Still pondering how she would go about taking care of something that was absolutely none of her business, Pam arrived at school. There was no student parking lot, since hardly any of her classmates had a vehicle, let alone a license to drive the vehicle that they didn't have. A Pam had acquired her driver's license through some somewhat devious means. Her dad, Al, had a friend who owed him. Al, that is. A huge favor. The kind of thing that changes your life forever. Seeing as he worked at the local DPS... As a driver's license official, the friend, not her dad, 
Al had arranged for his one and only to receive a graduated driver's license, which did allow underaged riders, it didn't allow underaged riders in her vehicle. A cerebellum had ridden with Pam on many occasions, not because Pam or her parents liked to break the law, but because they had no idea that there was such a law. Besides, you didn't need a license to drive a car. You needed a license to get stopped by the police for driving badly. The Green Lizard had no idea what all Pam was doing with her vehicle. Pam parked across the street from her school, grabbed her book bag pillowcase from the passenger seat, chugged down her coffee, and headed for class. The baseball cap felt odd since Pam wasn't a hat wearer. The right side of her face felt tight and dry from being exposed to the volcano's eruption just a few days ago. Paula had tried to use some makeup to make both sides look the same, and it had kind of worked. Some of her classmates were happy to be returning to class. They yelled back and forth, greeting each other as if having been separated for years instead of just three months. Pam wasn't thinking about school, as she was still thinking about her uncle's business and the people she had come to love. Being a senior, Pam was dressed in her official senior schoolgirl outfit. She felt a bit odd for such a get-up. Uh, she had aged at least a few years over the summer vacation. As she approached the entrance, a biker, holding his head under one arm, went sauntering by. Pam took note of the fact that nobody was screaming and running about, uh, scared of a headless biker. The biker looked kind of lost. He would stop and hold his head out to the side, firmly held by the long hair, and, and then he would move in the direction he was aiming his head. Pam moved over to a comfortable distance from him. Can I help you? She tried to keep her voice low enough to not attract any undue attention. The biker lifted his head up and pointed it at Pam's face. He looked a bit mean. You talking to me? His voice was raspy, as if his vocal cords were, well, they were unattached. Yes, Pam took a tentative step back as, as she looked about herself, hoping to not become the object of anyone's interest. Can't find my bike, he snarled, to show just how tough he was. As he spoke, he held his head up in the air and turned it back and forth, scanning the area for his missing motorcycle. Um, er, uh, where did you last see it? Pam checked her watch. She still had ten minutes to get to class. I was riding over there, and I turned that away. Then I rode this away, and then that way. And now I can't find it. As he was saying this, away and that away, he used his head to point out the directions, since both hands were busy holding his noggin. Pam got her phone out, and... Pam got her phone out of the pillowcase and opened her web page. She entered Biker and Killed and the school name. Then hit enter. <clears throat> After a thousand possible entries came up, uh, ten at a time, uh, Pam began to scroll through the different entries. Um, here's one that says there was a motorcycle race near here. No, nah, nobody died. Uh, you do know you're kind of... Her voice trailed off. Yeah, I kind of figured it out. He shook his head at her. Literally. Once his head stopped shaking, his eyes took on a while, a whole new look. The right one was pointed up, in the, up, up and to the right, while the left eye was still rolling around in a circle. Oh, I shouldn't ever do that. He made a gagging sound, and then some pukey-looking slime dribbled out from the top of his neck. Pam got busy researching for any dead motorcycle stories on her phone. Her watch said she now had five minutes until class. Ah, uh, oh, uh, here it is. Uh, a biker named Rumpus Ganglia was executed near here when he ran afoul of the Hinderkickers, a local bike gang. She scanned the page. It says it happened like 30 years ago. She gave the biker a glance. Yeah, that would be me, 
He swung his head around to look at her. So, does your fancy pants gadget say what happened to my bike? His face tried to look mean and nasty while asking for help at the same time. Pam scrolled through the rest of the article. I don't see anything about a disposition of your wheels. She looked at her watch. She now had 30 seconds till she... Oh, too late. Could we do this later today? I, I have to get to class. You're late and you'll probably be placed against the wall and shot. It's not like you haven't been looking for a while. Uh, can I go now, please? I promise I'll come back and help. Rumpus hung his head all the way to the ground. No need. I've been all alone ever since losing my head. His voice held all the sorrow of the universe. It took me three years to find it. My head, that is. It was stuffed down a sewer drain. Not that you'd care. He let out a sigh that showed how depressed a ghost could be. I'll just wander around mindlessly looking for my bike. I'll come back at, at 3.30ish and I'll help you. Uh, I promise. Pam scrambled through the door and tried to find her way to her homeroom class. She walked as fast as she could without violating the no running in the hallway unless being pursued by a man with a chainsaw rule. There it was, room 113, Mrs. Grampus, not known for liking tardy students. Pam opened the door and tried to enter without drawing any attention to herself. All eyes turned on her. Pam slipped into the first empty desk she spotted. No hats allowed in school. And you're late, Mrs. Grampus didn't smile one tiny bit. Pam reached up and pulled the hat off, and she could hear subdued laughter throughout the room. Mrs. Grampus just stared. Pam had combed the hair from the left side over to the missing half of her head and used a half a can of hairspray to keep it in place. But the baseball cap pulled the hair straight up. Now Pam was sporting an exotic kind of a mohawk on the left side of her head. A new looking hairdo. She used one hand to try to lay the hair back down. The hairspray now made her hand sticky. Class, be advised, from now on, no hats in school. She glared at Pam. And anybody arriving late should just report to Mr. Hammerhead's office and explain to him why you can't get to class on time. Pam tried to slide down to take refuge behind the top of her desk. She hoped this wasn't how the rest of the school year was going to be. Mrs. Goblin taught history class. Pam had had her last year. Last year had not gone very well. Pam watched the History Channel all the time, or at least all the time that she could. When it came to TV, nothing beat the History Channel, and when it came to answering questions in history class, Pam had relied on her vast knowledge of the Curse of Oak Island and ancient aliens and UFO hunters in all the best shows on TV. Too bad none of the questions on the tests were based on the shows. Uh, Pam had a good solid C average in history uh, last year. Come to think of it, she had a good solid C in just about everything. Mrs. Goblin took one look at Pam as she walked into class and had to sit down. Um, Miss Bogus, I see you've tried something new over summer vacation. Pam had gotten most of her hair laid over the bald spot. Well, most of the right side was more than a spot. At some point during homeroom, Pam had rubbed the right side of her forehead. The paint on her eyebrow was now smeared up to what should have been her hairline. It was just a good thing the bright red lipstick was covering most of the black dyed lips, but her gums were still a distinctive dark color. As Sandy, who was sitting right next to Pam, tried to act as if she didn't know her from Khrushchev. For those of you not familiar with the bag series, Sarah Bellum, her mother and sister Sandy were all living with the Bogus family because their house had partially collapsed during the mid-July snowstorm 
thus having to move into Pam's bedroom, which at the time she wasn't currently using, having been trapped outside her neighborhood. Perhaps now would be a good time to go back and read the first three novels in this awe-inspiring series. Before you get too far into this story and get lost in all of the missing details. A Pam had prepared for this year by reading as many books at work on history as she could find. She had read the history of Bigfooting, but found way too many mistakes, which, having lived in a cave with three Sasquatch just last week, she also read, well, she skimmed through a brief history of ufology, and there was a book on the Salem witch trials, but Pam hadn't gotten very far in it. Mrs. Goblin addressed the class, but her eyes seemed to stray to Pam. This year we'll be focusing on world history, so I hope y'all are ready for some homework. As noon time came around, Pam stepped outside to see about her lunch and try calling Cassandra or maybe Eddie to check in at the office. The phone rang and rang before being answered by Hildy? Or was it Hilda? They both sounded the same. This is the bag. What do you want? Oh, yeah, that was Hildy, all right. Howdy, Hildy. Uh, this is Pam. Pam Bogus? Yes. Is Cassandra or Mr. Techno around? I need to speak with one or the other. She heard the receiver being dropped to the desktop and what sounded like somebody walking away to see about the requested individuals. After a wait during which Pam had pulled her lunch sack out and found her sandwich had been flattened at some point during the day, the phone was answered by a female voice. Pamela, dear, how are you doing? I was so worried when you went missing. Did you find Bigfoot? How was the weather? I hope you got enough to eat. Mr. Armstrong said he doesn't like your aunt, but then he doesn't like anybody. Cassandra was asking way too many questions for Pam to get a question in on her own. When Cassandra had to stop in order to breathe, Pam asked what she had to know. Have you found out anything about that matter I asked you about before I left? Pam hoped Cassandra could read her mind, but that wasn't really one of her talents. Cassandra was an energy healer, not a psychic. Oh, you mean, what's her name? Cassandra sounded as if somebody were looking over her shoulder. I tried my best. I even got Prince Wapo to have a go at it, but he didn't say much about anything. Not surprising, since Prince Wapo was a giant cat that lived at the bag office. Man, I'm worried about those two, or that one, depending. Pam wished she could run by the office. Even though she was just 17 and not really in charge of anything. Her official title as paranormal investigator, having been promoted from receptionist just last month. Her uncle Ray owned the mansion where the bag was located. This caused Pam to suddenly wonder. If her grandfather had owned the business and her uncle was now in charge, where, if at all, did her dad fit into the operation? Listen, hon, you just worry about your classes. We'll take care of any weirdness around here. Cassandra was always trying to get Pam to take more interest in her own life and let others worry about the business. Pam looked at her watch. I gotta go. Bye. She hit the end and stuffed her lunch bag back into the pillowcase. as She had only a few minutes to get to class. Better hurry. We don't want to be late again today. Pam was doing some extreme walking, trying to get to home ec before the bell rang, when her eyes were drawn to a bizarre object semi-hidden under a staircase. A shoved in behind some boxes marked shop class stuff and partially covered with an oily stained tarp was what looked like she would have to stop and uh, take a better look by it, but the clock was not with her today. As she bolted through the door, the bell made its announcement. Mrs. Sandtiger looked at Pam as if Pam were a growing antenna from the top of her head. Pam passed one hand over her head to be sure nothing was growing there other than a half a head of hair. This was at least one demanding class Pam had 
this last year as she was looking forward to a nice relaxing hour. Let me say that again. This was one of the least demanding classes Pam had this year, and she was looking forward to a nice relaxing hour. Pam sat in one of the chairs in the front office, waiting her turn to see Mr. Hammerhead. As she felt as if this was unfair since it wasn't really her fault that the stove burst into flames. As she was heating a little bit of grease when it caught fire. Pam just instinctively threw a cup of water on the fire. How was she supposed to know hot grease would do that if you threw water on it? I could have told you that. And you didn't say anything because? Well, I thought you knew. Now, not only was Pam sporting a new hairdo, her dress looked like Swiss cheese. There were tiny little holes all down the front, and one shoe no longer had a toe in it. She held her pillowcase in her lap, wondering what could possibly go wrong next. The door to the principal's office opened. Out stepped a girl, about Pam's age. Or, more correctly, she came oozing out as if being controlled by a very bad puppeteer, with too long of strings attached to all the wrong places. Pam looked at Mindy. She looked like death warmed over, but not very well. Her dress had seen better days, and she was supposed to be in uniform like everybody else. She had one shoe in her hand, and the other looked like it had been drugged behind a car down a gravel road. The heel was missing, so she only lurched a little as she walked. As Pam entered the principal's office, trying to act as if this was simply a social visit... Mr. Hammerhead just looked at Pam and then pointed to a chair in front of his desk. Pam sat still holding her pillowcase. She was about to dive in with her defense statement, trying to give her side of the incident, so just maybe he would see it her way. As she opened her mouth, Mr. Hammerhead held up one hand. He closed his eyes and he sat there practicing breathing. After a few minutes, Pam remembered to close her mouth. This was not Pam's first visit to the front office, nor her second. You could say she was quite well recognized by everybody working here. She looked around, trying to judge just how mad the principal might be. There was a photograph of him and a bunch of other guys sitting on Harleys out by the lake. Maybe, just maybe, she could deflect some of the upcoming trouble by striking first. What was it Mr. Armstrong had said? A shoot first and ask permission later? Or something like that. Mr. Hammerhead, why is there a motorcycle parked in the stairwell by home ec? His eyes flew open and he stared at her as if not understanding her question. Motorcycle? Home ec? Stairwell? Oh, that. He wasn't really a whole, it wasn't really a whole motorcycle, just the frame and one tire, but uh, still an odd thing to see near a class on cooking things. I told the janitor to get rid of that hunk of junk, but he still thinks he can salvage something from it. Mr. Hammerhead stared off into space as if uh, going on a little ride inside his head. Where'd it come from? She thought she might just have an idea, but wanted to be sure before taking action. Oh, Lord, that thing just showed up one day, maybe 30 years ago. One of the guys in shop class said he found it in a ditch near here. We all tried to rebuild it, but we wound up just using it for parts. You've been a principal for 30 years? Hmm? No, 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 no. I used to attend school here. I was in class with your father. He had a dreamy look again, as if reliving old times. If I'd only known then. Oh, what was I supposed to say again? He looked at Pam's hair, and then he looked at her smeared eyebrow. His eyes took in the burned dress, and then he remembered. Miss Sandtiger said you nearly burned the home room act down. What do you have to say about that? No one was as surprised as me when that little grease fire turned into a full-blown explosion. It was just a good thing there were plenty of fire extinguishers around, since this was not the first time Homec had become a firefighting training class. 
Did you know you never throw water on a grease fire? Why not? Pam thought maybe she already knew. Well, because it blows up, that's why. Mr. Hammerhead gave Pam a long, hard stare. Didn't Miss Sandtiger go over this before you began to cook? Pam had a niggling suspicion there had been something like that being passed around just about the time she was contemplating the odds of the understar motorbike understair motorbike might belong to the headless biker. Her brain felt warm as she tried to ponder her thoughts into order. I think I just might know who that motorcycle belongs to, or rather used to belong to. Mr. Hammerhead gave Pam a look that very much summed up his assessment of her ability to come up with information concerning a bike from 30 years ago. Pam stormed on. There were a bunch of bikers called the Hinder Kickers, and they chased down a guy named Rumpus Ganglia from another bike gang, and they killed him. It happened right near here 30 years ago. I just wonder if the cops would be interested in knowing where that motorcycle wound up. She wasn't so much threatening the principal as she just wanted that bike. Having hung around with Mr. Armstrong for part of her summer vacation, Pam had managed to pick up some of his less than tactful speech abilities. What? Police? Why would they be interested? He knew, but he was trying to play dumb. Well, if you really want to get rid of it, I do have a pickup and I'd be more than happy to take it away to the dump. Pam hoped her plan worked. She didn't need the principal mad at her, and not this soon in the year. Mr. Hammerhead stared, uh, started bouncing a pencil on his desk. You'd do that for me? He gave Pam a long, hard look. I'm not going to tell you to do anything that might be construed as illegal or unethical, but if you were to just haul that thing away, I'm sure nobody would say anything about it. Pam jumped to her feet and shoved her hand out to shake on the deal. Mr. Hammerhead jerked back in his chair as if Pam might bite. He then carefully shook hands as if not sure what he was doing. Pam got out of there before Mr. Hammerhead forgot he was supposed to be reading Pam the riot act about burning the home ec room up a bit. Uh, checking her watch, she still had 20 minutes of class to go, but didn't think it was a good idea to go back to face Miss Sandtiger this soon after the untoward incident. Pam went looking for the janitor's cart. She found a cart used to haul trash cans from floor to floor. She looked around to see if anybody was around who might lay claim to the cart. When nobody seemed to mind her taking it, she took it, pushing the cart down the hallway to where she had seen the motorcycle frame. Now for the hard part. Pam wasn't opposed to hard work, as she had volunteered to mow the lawn at home each summer. True, she had planned to work on her tan as well as the yard, but still she had put in a good couple of years of grass clipping and raking. But lefting a motorcycle frame along with its back tire was just beyond her abilities. And being caught by the janitor, that didn't help at all either. Mr. Mako spotted the teen pushing the trash cart down the hallway and followed to see what kind of nefarious activity the girl was up to. When he saw her trying to abscond with the beat-up, broken-down remains of the bike under the stairwell, he sprang into action. And what do you think you're doing other than attending classes like you're supposed to be doing? He gave Pam a look that said, well, it said, tell me what you're doing. Pam looked at the janitor. Mr. Hammerhead asked me to haul this piece of junk away, and that's what I'm doing. Uh, hauling it away, that is. Mr. Mako believed her, of course. Well, of course he believed her. Once he called the front office and spoke to the secretary who put him in contact with the boss who told him to do whatever it took to get that broken piece of junk out of the school. Mr. Mako picked up the frame and loaded it on the cart. He then pushed it down the hall and out the door to Pam's pickup where he lifted the frame up and into the bed of the truck. Pam was busy looking, trying to spot the headless biker who was nowhere to be seen. 
You got a real nice vehicle here, Mr. Mako was admiring her truck. Pam looked at the janitor and then at her truck. She didn't remember it being quite this shiny. Uh, I got it in a swap with my aunt. Her car had been ripped up by the visiting mechanic who mistook her car for a junker. That should say something about her ex-car. Pam thanked Mr. Mako for the help and then offered to haul the cart back to where she had found it. And Mr. Mako just nodded his head, still looking at her ride. I got it, he began walking back across the street, cart in tow. Pam was about to head back to prepare herself for math class. What could possibly go wrong in math class? A head appeared over the side of her truck bed. The biker was squatting down on the ground, holding his head up by the neck. The head moved left and then right, and then a smile spit his face. You found it. This is my bike. I've been looking for it for forever. He stood up, still holding his head over the fender of the truck. Pam was glad he had his bike back, even if it was just the frame. It was hidden in the mechanic's shop for a while, and then they moved it to home ec for a few years. I, I hope you can find all the parts to get it running again, as she doubted he would ever find the 65 to 80 percent that was missing. Rumpus pulled himself up over the side of the truck. This maneuver involved both hands, and this led to him dropping his head face first into the bed of the truck. Ow, dang it. I hate it when that happens. His body got down on its hands and knees and felt around until finding his head, which had rolled over under the frame. The biker lifted the frame up as if it still had two wheels, and an engine, and a seat, and, well, all the missing parts. He held the bike with one hand while using the other to pass his head back and forth, looking over the skeleton. Wow, I don't know how to thank you. You got anybody you need killed? No, no, no thank you. Uh, I don't want to kill anyone, and uh, neither should you. Pam felt odd, having been offered such a form of repayment. So now what? Do you think you can... She watched in amazement. What was so amazing was Rumpus had pulled the frame up and was swinging his right foot up and down as if trying to kickstart the engine. Pam was about to say something about the futility of such a move when the roar of uninhibited power filled the air. Rumpus began to move forward. The tailgate of Pam's pickup, still holding the frame up in his hands, well, his hand, his head was now sitting in the gap between the headlight and the gas tank. As the front tire cleared the tailgate, a fully formed motorcycle came flying from the bed and landed on the street behind her vehicle. It flew down the street, made a sharp U-turn, and came rumbling back to her side. Rumpus wiped what might have been some tears, but it was probably sweat from his cheek. Kid, I don't know what to say. If you need anything, just ask. Uh, are you any good at math? Rumpus let out a demonic laugh and roared away, leaving a black smoking skid mark behind. Pam felt a lot better about her day, and then she remembered she had math class to get to. Well, nothing can possibly go wrong there. Nurse Shark looked at Pam's ear and wondered how it got caught in an abacus. You were working a math problem and you thought you heard something? Yeah, it sounded like my abacus said hello. Pam felt just a bit embarrassed by the latest incident. Her right ear was partially threaded through the space between the earth beads in the upper deck. It didn't hurt all that much since her ear had gone numb. Were you adding or subtracting? Dividing, Pam hoped this would make a difference. A nurse shark was at a loss as to what to do. You want me to try and pull it loose? If you can without pulling my ear off or maybe more hair or, or causing any brain damage... Pam closed her eyes and gritted her teeth. There, all done. Nurse Shark had popped the upper deck loose and simply lifted the device off. Pam looked at the abacus and then the nurse and then she felt where her ear used to be. It was still there. Uh, gee, thanks. 
I was kind of afraid I was going to lose my ear. If you hurry, you can get back to class just in time to go to your next class. Nurse Shark filled out a form stating that Pam had been seen by her but did not require much more than a good ear massage. Pam was glad to be nearing the end of her day. One more class to go. Ah, but it was gym class. Her worst subject. Pam made her way to the locker room. Mrs. Bull was the gym teacher. She was short and round and wheezed if she did anything more strenuous than stand up. There was a pack of cigarettes rolled up in the sleeve of her t-shirt. The class was doing calisthenics while Mrs. Bull sat in a chair reading a magazine called Runner's World. All right, class, we're going to go for a little run. By we, Mrs. Bull meant they. She hadn't been on the running side since Nixon claimed to not be a crook. Be back here by, she checked her watch, 3.15 so you can get cleaned up. And class was officially over at 3.30. Pam had done a little running over the summer. Not running as in a means of staying in shape or preparing for some marathon. No, Pam had found a few occasions to run for her life. Like the time she found herself being pursued by an unknown creature while lost in the haunted outhouse at the state park. As she had spent some time running from the girl-devouring monster in the basement of the bag building, it had turned out to be a giant worm. Then Pam had found a reason to run from Demon Waldo, who was intent on turning her and Sarah into a mid-afternoon snack. Mr. Armstrong had shown up with a shotgun loaded with double-ot buck and jalapeno juice. She had run up and down the stairs at work way too many times, and most of those times had been in heels. She also had occasion to run from a pack of poltergeist, 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 ghost chickens, intent on protecting their hidden treasure. And, of course, there had been the mountain lion, the pack of wolves, and the weird bizarre creatures in the alternative world. Yes, Pam had done a little running over summer vacation. Pam took off running around the track, fully expecting to be somewhere in the middle of the last half of the pack. She let her mind wander, which was something she excelled at, especially when there was a test needing her full attention. Hey, Bogus, you can stop now. Mrs. Bull was sitting in the bleachers, keeping an eye on the class while paying full attention to her magazine. Hit the showers along with the rest in your class, are you thinking of going out for track? Pam looked around and noticed she was the only one still running. It's amazing what running for your life can do for you. Pam opted to skip the shower and head straight over to the office to see what all damage had been done while she was away. Having spent the last week of summer vacation looking for and trying to get back from Bigfoot, Pam was worried that certain members of the staff specifically the receptionist, might do bad things in her absence. Pam set her pillowcase on the seat and fired up her pickup. She was still getting used to her new used vehicle and kept noticing things about it she had missed the entire two days she'd had it. The paint job looked a lot better than it had Sunday when she'd first seen it. The interior looked a bit nicer as well. Pam just wrote this off as being too tired to think yesterday. And with that, I am going to break. I will be back with more exciting adventures or misadventures of Pam Bogus soon. If you haven't noticed, I'll just fill you in on a little something. All of the teachers, including the principal and the janitor, are named for sharks. Until next time, this is Chris James for Storytime. Are you, are you coming to the tree With a strong upper man, the same murder three Strange things that I've been hearing, a stranger would it be If we met at midnight in the hanging tree